This video is brought to you by Hunting Beast Gear, the best equipment made for mobile hunters. Deer hunters seem to go through stages. You know, first they just want to get a deer. Then they get that deer down, and then they want to get a buck. <clears throat> then they get that buck down, and they want to get a nice buck. Then they get a nice buck, and they want to get lots of nice bucks. And they start getting to a point where they're growing in their hunting career where they start shooting, you know, that 100 to 130 inch bucks, maybe occasional 140 on a regular basis. <clears throat> and they can do that almost every year if they get to be a good hunter. But they don't seem to get beyond that stage. And I think there's a reason for that. Because there's a huge difference between hunting big bucks or good bucks and mature bucks. Once they get to a certain age class, and I know I've said this before, it's like going out and hunting rabbits hoping to shoot a pheasant. It's like they're a whole different species and you have to reinvent the way you hunt. Most of the time when I've shot in those, you know, 100 to 130 inch bucks, they're in the funnels, they're on the food plots, they're in places where I'm just hunting for a good deer, and I'm getting them. But when I shoot those mature bucks, there seems to be a different theme to it. When I shoot a deer that's five or six years old, it's almost pretty certain that I'm hunting that deer, I, I've seen that deer, I know where that deer lives, and I'm sneaking in for a kill. It's a lot different. You don't seem to shoot many of them on accident. I thought it would be kind of fun this off season while we got a little time and we're bored to put together a video of my top bucks and do the stats on them. And then at the end of it, when we get done with all the bucks, talk about you know how many of them were shot on the first sit, how many of them were shot that I was previously hunting, you know, and go through those types of stats and really narrow it down why we kill mature bucks and what's different about the hunting for mature bucks. On this first buck, I was hunting this area on public land that was remote. Getting back there, you had to cross this fairly large river and it was deep water. And I found a sh the shallowest spot I found was about waist deep and fast. And I would strip my clothes off, carry them over with me, and then get dressed on the other side so that I wouldn't get my clothes wet and then go back there. And I went back there in August, maybe late July, hard to remember, it's way back in the 90s, early 90s. And um, I went walking around scouting and I had my binoculars with me and I was walking a ridge and watching a river bottom in the evening and I saw this big buck come out of this oxbow on the river and go to a scrape in August. When have you ever seen a buck work a scrape in August? And he's working this scrape, and I'm watching, and um, I back off, I came back a few days later, watched again, and the same buck came out right at dark, worked that scrape again, and a nine-pointer came out just adjacent to it and worked that scrape. So both of these bucks were bedded in, real you know, in this oxbow, real close to each other, but not in the same spot, and they were staging right where this scrape was, and then moving on. So I watched them a few more times, and then I was really pumped to hunt them opening weekend, but I also had my first bear tag. And I had a bear hunt planned. I had this plan from before I even saw this buck. So I went on my bear hunt, but the whole time I'm thinking about that, that buck. And I ended up killing my bear on opening weekend of bow season for deer. And racing back, I hadn't even taken the bear out of the truck yet. I went straight to that hunting spot before I even went home, went back there, got over the top of this scrape, and it was raining. It was on and off raining the whole day. And as soon as the rain lightened up in the early afternoon, you know, like one or two in the afternoon, it's real early, that buck came out of that bedding area, came straight underneath me, worked the scrape, and I arrowed him. The buck was a giant. It was 24 inches wide, had 11 points. Uh, just massive beams, uh, real heavy buck, 
we estimate he was probably in the 240 pound range, maybe 250, just a giant chest on him. So some of the key takeaways, I was hunting within 100 yards of the buck bedding area where he was bedding on that oxbow. It was remote where people don't go. It was opening weekend in mid-September. He was using a buck scrape, a buck bedding scrape, which is what I call a scrape that's located at a bedding area. And they use those to um, communicate with other bucks, not with those. So it's a, uh, it's a this is my area type of scrape. He's just kind of mildly at that time of the year competing with this other buck over that bedding area. It was a midday hunt. It was the first time I ever sat that spot. First time sit. Before I killed the buck, I did an observation and watched the buck coming out and then moved in for the kill. Okay, my second top buck was a buck that we dubbed the slob buck. Uh, this buck, um, I saw him from the road, driving down the road on public land, and started observing him. Started going out of my way to watch him. It was at one of the biggest parking lots on the public land area around me. So I would drive our station wagon. Okay, it's just about sunset and I'm getting ready to go uh, glassing for deer. Uh, I got my binoculars and uh, here's my truck. It's not the vehicle we're taking. Um, as most of you wear, camouflage when you're hunting for the deer. Uh, I use camouflage for other hunters when uh, I go glassing. And tonight we're taking my camouflage vehicle. It comes, it's a, a Ford station wagon. And it comes with animal rescue stickers. And uh, I break for raccoons. <laughs> you uh, really want to keep other hunters from uh, figuring out where you're hunting. Um, if they see your truck parked in a spot and see you looking out the window with binoculars, uh, they're going to figure out something. They're going to start looking to see what you're seeing. So uh, keeping it on the stealth side is a good idea. And I put uh, bumper stickers on it, said I'd break for raccoons and stuff. And I'd park there and watch right in the parking lot where all the hunters go in and out and watch this buck. Now, again, this buck was coming out of bedding, going 100 yards and working a scrape in, in uh, early season. And there was another buck coming out of the adjacent bedding next to it, working that same scrape. So both my top two bucks were doing the same behavior. <clears throat> Now the other buck was a pretty good buck. It was a 140 class 10 pointer. This goes back to the early 90s. Um, this buck was doing it on a pretty regular basis and uh, it was a pretty open area. The beds were in water, isolated uh, pieces of uh, ground sticking up out of water in swamp. And the human trail just led right past this area and it just didn't look what, like what most people would think is deer terrain. It was right next to the parking lot. And there was a willow tree in there where I could get in that willow tree about this high and just blend into the branches. And that buck, um, when I finally went in there and hunted, it was the first time I ever went in there, first sit again, otherwise I just observed from a distance. When I went in there, the first buck in was that 140 class 10 pointer. And at that time in my career, that was a pretty tempting buck. But I knew if I shot that buck, I'd blow my chance at that real big one. So I let the 140 go. And it actually walked past me, walked through the parking lot, right next to the parked cars where other hunters were parked, and across the street on the private. And then while I was watching that thing go, out of the corner of my eye, there was a little ditch there that would fill up with water, like a creek. And there's a union of this creek, and we're to, uh, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a ripple in the water, and I looked over, and that big buck was coming right underneath me. And he got to really close by and went up to the scrape to work it. And I shot him at really close range. He took one jump, looked around, and fell over dead. 
Now this buck was dubbed the 400 pound slob by my buddies. Not a very cool name, but, <laughs> but it fit. Um, we did weigh this buck. We field dressed and weighed it. We had a uh, farm scale, but it bottomed the farm scale out uh, before we got it fully off the ground and it was a 300 pound scale. So we know the deer weighed at least 300 pounds dressed. Key takeaways, right next to the parking lot. First sit, early season, buck bed scrape. It was an evening hunt. I was hunting within 100 yards of his bedding area. I observed him before I went in for the hunt. And it was public land. The third biggest buck was the Cattail King buck. That's also my most recent kill. That buck, I was hunting for several years. I've got trail cam pictures of him out in the marsh. Um, I, I ran into him a few times. I was really having a hard time killing that buck because he lived in an area that had no trees, which is pretty common with these really big bucks. I searched that cat, those cattails down. I tried to find some kink in his armor. There's a couple of trees I could hunt him out of, and he had figured me out in those spots. He would check those spots to see if I'm there. It was getting to the point where it was really hard to get on this buck, and I was trying to find some sort of way to hunt him. Maybe a spot with some short cattails, maybe some way to get at him. And out of frustration, I went out and I scouted really hard and tried to find some kink in that bedding area. And the area he lived in was rather large. It was probably like uh, 40 or 50 acres of cattails and very, very remote. Most of it was in water, but there'd be little high spots where you could bed. And I went in there and really started scouring one day just looking and looking and I found something I hadn't seen before and what that was was a little dry hump of land that came out of the water that was about 20 or 30 feet long and about 10 yards wide and was covered with willow brush and when I saw that that willow brush I went to it and all the willow brush was rubbed rubbed heavy from something big branches were broken little trees were broken in half Oh, there's rubs in here galore. There's a good little bed in there. Some back in there. Every tree's rubbed in here. And there's beds in there everywhere. Maybe as many as 40 or 50 beds that you could clearly see that had been used more than once. Imprinted into the ground in this willow brush. And the first thing I thought was, was this willow brush loses its leaves in early October. And all those rubs and all those beds, that buck was not bedding there in the open sun. He would have been sitting there in the wide open underneath those willow branches when they don't have leaves. But when they're covered in leaves, it'd be like little caves. So it was obvious to me that that buck was bedding there at the time frame of September when there was leaves in, on those trees. So I knew I had to hunt it in September. We're on a little island out in the cattails that actually leads to some trees we can hunt out of. Look at this bed. I'm pretty sure they were bedding in here back in like September. There's no fresh sign, but that was obviously heavy used for a short period of time. It's got some really old rubs in it. They're small. But look at this. This would be like a cave when this grass is up here. You could walk right by this thing and never even know, you know he's in here. He could, he's hiding there. And look how warm that is. That's a good spot. Yeah. A lot of beds right in here. I followed this trail out of there and followed it up to a little dry mass point, like a grassy point that went up onto some private land. And there was one tree I could get in, and it was about this big around. And I could get a stand about this high. And I could shoot over the top of the brush at the buck coming at me. So I got that set up and, and, and uh, left it alone for the whole year. Then the next year, I went in there in early season, the first day we had a brisk north wind where I could circle around him in the water without making too much noise or getting heard and the wind would be in my favor and get up this tree. sign I hit. I hit a 
lot of sign as I got close here. And the beds are right there. And there's a the heavy trail comes out like this under here. And there's some giant fresh rubs right back here. And the very first time I hunted it, a doe got up right beside me. And another one got up in front of me. And the one in front of me started feeding right underneath me. And then I hear something coming from the willow brush. And it's getting closer and closer, but that doe gets right underneath me. And remember, I'm only this high. She looks over and sees the stick on the tree, sees the second stick, then sees me and blows out of there and runs. When she does that, she circles around to in front of me, back to the point of the grass, where whatever's coming out of that willow brush, which I'm imagining is the buck I'm after, is coming right at it, and it just starts blowing and blowing and blowing. When it finally left, the next time I heard what was coming from the willow brush, it was going away. So then, I hunted that spot the very next day, just in case that buck wasn't that spooked from all the blowing. Sometimes they're spooked, sometimes they're not. You never know. Nothing came in. And then, I did what most hunters wouldn't do, I left the spot alone. And I left it alone for a whole year till the next year, because I know if you pound those spots, you over hunt them. When that deer does come through, whether it's at night or whenever, and smells that you've been in there that much, it's done. He ain't using it no more. It'll turn out like those other trees where I could have hunted them that he figured me out in. So I waited till that next year. And the very next year, the very first day, which was the fifth day of the season, in mid-September, that we had a brisk north wind, I circled that bedding area, through the water, up the tree, and the only thing that was different was the does weren't better there this time. Set up good. That over there is um, buck bedding out in there. And there's a trail that comes in just like this and comes around down here. And another one that comes down here. Um, in the past, the does have bedded right along in here. In satellite beds and small bucks. And the bigger stuff beds out there. When I hunted this last year, the does got up bedded right beside me here in that brush and by that little tree there. Within shooting range, they got out of the beds. And uh, they never knew I was here until they got right underneath me and got my wind. And then they spooked and they ran back and they started blowing and blowing and blowing. And at the same time, I could hear a buck coming out of that bedding area. I never saw it. It might not have been my dream bug, but I had a vision of what it was.
got liver or guts. It's a dead deer. It's just a matter of finding them. He didn't go but uh, 20 yards. I saw him right behind the bushes moving a couple minutes ago. Man, that thing's a monster. I think I might have to leave that one overnight. Check it out, Dan. Nice Holy job, buddy. cow, dude. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good job. All right. That thing is awesome. That thing is nice. Max is excited. Good job, Max. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah. Uh, actually, this deer got off the trail where it was and got off to the side, and we lost the blood trail. And uh, probably would have had a very difficult time finding this thing in this maze of cattails. Absolutely. Um, but the dog just ran right to it. Absolutely. It's amazing what they can do. Yes, amazing. It's, it, um, Max is my new best friend. Now this was an older mature deer. Based on the trail cam picks, I would say he was at least seven years old. Um, we had six guys with us and we tied him to a, a pole and we couldn't hold him off the ground, field dressed. That's how heavy that thing was. We went in to get him at 8 a.m. the next morning after he was shot and it took us till two in the afternoon to get him to the truck. The key takeaways, it was the third time I hunted the spot, but the first time that year. It was public land, the buck was bedded on a spot isolated by water, meaning it was completely circled by water. You seen a trend here? It was an evening hunt, it was very remote, it was quite a ways from the parking lot, well over a mile probably a mile and a half. Hunters would have to cross deep water to get to where I was hunting. My fourth biggest buck, Rome legend. That buck was living on private land and coming over to the public. And I was glassing it and seeing it and shining it. And the only time I would ever see it on the public land side of the road was in rut. But other people were seeing it, and it was causing quite the attention in the area. And there was a lot of people hunting that area for that buck. And he had a heavy scrape line coming right across the road, right up the, the, uh, the trail that all the hunters took into the woods. And he had scrapes and rubs all along that trail. And there were hunters literally hunting right over the human access trail over the top of these scrapes. The year before I got him, I went in with a friend from the uh, forum and he went hunting one way and I went over and went after this buck and I jumped him out of a, a, a satellite bed. He wasn't quite in the bedding area because he bedded with a doe. And I, the doe went one way and he went the other and I tried to set up on him where I spooked him, figuring he's going to come back looking for that doe after a little while and he did. But what he did was he circled around downwind. And my big mistake was I tried to get right to where he'd come back for the doe, and I should have went to the first um, transition line downwind, because that's where he, what he did is he walked that transition line downwind until he got my wind and spooked off, and I never had a shot. But the next year, um, now I was starting to get a pattern where I was seeing what he was doing. I noticed that he was coming in there, and a sign was picking up every year from him, right at rut, like pre-rut, around that October time frame, you know, uh, late October, last week of October is when he'd show up on my side of the road. The previous two seasons, I noticed that every time he was in there, there was a rub line coming out of that bedding area that would get tore up. Now, it didn't go right to the bedding area. It started out further from it, so people didn't really catch on and follow it right to the bedding, and he did it at night. But I knew when those rubs this high up on that tree line were rubbed that that buck was in there. And I kept watching and on Halloween day I noticed it was ripped up. And I went back there to hunt that evening and I got back there at like 2 in the afternoon and it was tough because I had to walk past like 5 different guys hunting even though I was hunting really close to the road. And there was guys with decoys and guys calling and guys mad because I'm walking past them. Um, but I ended up weaseling around all these guys and getting to where I needed to be to kill this deer in daylight. And I got right up to 75 yards from the bedding area and got up a tree and 
about an hour before dark, maybe 45 minutes before dark, wasn't even quite sunset, Buck stood up in the bed and started coming my way. But by the time he got that 75 yards underneath me, it was actually almost closing time when I shot him. So anybody back further, all those other people, didn't even stand a chance. But I ended up getting them, uh, dropped them right there, spine shot them, and then I put a couple more on them because I was afraid he was going to run off on me. Holy crap. <laughs> Jesus. I told you he's a good one. I'll pull his head out of here so we can take a good look at him. He's got to be 21 inside, maybe? Yeah, I just think he's a little bit wider than he thought. Holy crap, Dave. <laughs> Look at the mass on that thing. Yeah. That was a, a, a really cool experience because everybody in the area was after the buck. But it had its good and its bad because that was the point where a lot of people in the area started uh, really disliking me because they were after that buck. Everybody started waving at me. Some of them with the whole hand, some of them with one finger. But they all waved. <laughs> some of the takeaways, now I'd hunted that spot before but it was the first time that year that I hunted that spot. It was public land. I was within 100 yards of the bedding. His bed was isolated by water all the way around his bed. I was specifically hunting this buck just like the previous three. I used his sign, the rub line, to tell me when he was there. It was an evening hunt. The next buck is the pond jumper buck. This buck was a private land buck and it was a road trip buck. It was in Buffalo County, Wisconsin on a, on a property I had gotten permission to hunt on. I went there with a friend, and uh, that friend went home early because it was 85 degrees out, and it, he felt it was October lull, and with the heat, we'd never kill a deer, they wouldn't move in daylight, blah, blah, blah. Where I took it as, okay, it's 85 degrees, what are these bucks going to do? And it, I didn't let it phase me that that guy wanted to leave, and I let him leave. And I went and hunted over a water hole. There's a water hole on the other side of this corn field. And when we circled the ridge, there's a huge scrape right here, even though it's early October, that's been used this morning. Going into the, there's fresh rubs and stuff on the other side of the cornfield, going into the water hole. And it's really hot today, so I'm figuring he's going straight to the water. Buck would be bedding on a point. There's a point coming off of that water hole. And I figured anything bedding on that point would come straight to that water hole, drink, and then move on. Now the setup was, wasn't too ideal because there wasn't very good trees around this water hole. And the tree I was in was kind of a telephone pole and I was trying to look like the tree. And before the buck came in, a doe and fawn came in and they immediately saw me in the tree, blew and spook. So I didn't have a lot of confidence. And then uh, a while later, it got dead calm to the point where you could hear a needle drop. So. I didn't have a lot of confidence, but I heard something walking from the point coming towards me. And then I could see the feet through the uh, leaves, like below the canopy. And then it popped out, and I could tell it was a shooter right away. But instead of going to the other side of the pond, it came up right underneath me. And you could tell it was really, really nervous. And uh, it was getting, like, jumpy every time something would move. And I was beyond myself. I had no idea how I could possibly get my bow back. I'm right on top of this thing, you know, five, six yards. Probably don't look like that in film because you got the camera zoomed all the way back. But that deer is right, I'm right on top of him and I'm figuring if I draw that bow, he's going to catch it. 
So I'm sitting there just waiting and waiting uh, for an opportunity, figuring I'm probably going to wait till he leaves. And as he's leaving, try to get the bull back and get a shot, but not try to take a shot when he's that close. But then a little squirrel did me a favor and made some noise on the other end of the pond. And that deer jerked like this and looked at the, the squirrel away from me, gave me that opportunity to draw the bull. Got me another one. <laughs> I had a doe and a button buck fawn come in a, a little while ago and they, they busted me. And uh, when this thing came in, he was so tense, I thought he was gonna bust me too. I had him at, uh, I don't know, that wasn't even five yards. <laughs> something spooked him from behind, a, a squirrel or something broke a branch. And I, uh, he, he spun his head around to look at that and I took that opportunity to get the bow drawn and I thought for sure he was gonna bolt out of there. He didn't. He calmed down, I got the pin on him and just dropped it. And it looked like it was perfect. It looked like a hard shot. Four finger track. That's where he was standing. There's my setup up there. He ran right across the pond over to there and down into the ravine. You see where he crashed through here? See the, the trees all wet from the water on him over to the pond. I don't see any blood yet, but it didn't look like there was an exit. It looked like it buried in the far shoulder. Hopefully we get some blood so I can find the thing. Look at that track. Holy cow. It ran down here. There's some blood. Good color to it. Yeah. Okay, now he's bleeding good. There's good blood here. Okay. Now where do you go? There's a hoof print there, there. I think I see him. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's him. Slip over there. I see a belly. I don't know if you can see it on camera. It's in some stuff. Oh, that's a down deer. Come on, baby. That's him. He's down. I can't see the rack from here, though. Oh, now I see it. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. Nice. Jeez, he didn't get... He didn't get 100 yards, not even. Look at that, six by five with a, that ain't a drop time, it's a kicker. He's got split brows on both sides. I'll get him tagged and then I'll go get the rat slayer. All right. Another one bites the dust. Nice summer cape. Oh, that's sweet. First sit of the year. I was within 100 yards of bedding. This particular buck I had never seen before, but it was a road trip, so that's expected. It was an evening hunt. The bed was in a spot over the point where it was overlooking the parking area where we parked, the property where, where the landowner was where we came in from. The buck was bedded on that point watching that. And I was able to circle around. I had to hunt him on a just off wind because he's bedded on that point watching the farm. I had to circle all the way around up here and get the wind blowing just off, kind of like, like this, and get it to go down the valley and had him come in with the wind just off when I shot him. The next buck was a big eight pointer. This buck I found during the summer glassing, watching a river bottom. I saw him coming out of a thicket that was actually right against the road 
where the place where you'd park would draw you straight back, but he was bedding right next to the road off to the side, real close to the access. In kind of a thick, treeless area. Right away on opening day, I went in and hunted him, right where he comes in and out of that bedding area, and I had no luck. So I started hopping around all over the place, all the little bedding areas in the area, knowing he was in there somewhere. And towards rut, I started to see sign that he was back in that same bedding area where I seen him in the summer. And there wasn't much huntable terrain down there, but there was a willow tree back in there that you could get up into without a stand. And I felt that that buck had to go through this little funnel between the access trail and, and the river and come within distance of that tree. And there was a lot of signs showing that he was doing that. But I watched it from a distance. I had only gotten in there opening day and now it was rut. And I had gotten really sick. Um, it was November 4th and uh, I had a bad fever. You know, I, was, I was puking and, and everything. And I woke up to a thunderstorm. And I really felt confident about that spot and about the timing and about it being rut. And I went out anyways in a lull in the storm. But by the time I got in the tree, it really started pouring and getting nasty and vertical wind and thunder and, and lightning. And by the time it was legal hours, it was still pretty dark out just because of the storm clouds and stuff. And I could not look in the direction that the deer was coming from because of the vertical or horizontal uh, rain blowing in my face. So I uh, had my back to the tree and I just kind of glimpsed around and... And one of those glimpses, the buck was right here beside me walking past. And I just spun, drew, and shot. And I remember my arrow going right through him and into the river. And he bolted forward, but I was so sick, and uh, at that time just shivering violently, that I got down and went home and uh, laid down for a few hours and then went back with a friend and found the buck. It hadn't gone far. Um, it didn't even make it into the bedding area, but it made it out of my sight. It was a pretty good buck. But uh, I know it was uh, over 200 pounds dressed. I don't remember exactly what it was. 204, I think, dressed. So the takeaways. I was 200 yards from the bedding area. It was a morning hunt. And notice how I'm a little further back in the mornings. And that's because those deer tend to, when they get close to those bedding areas, circle in from downwind. So I do better in the mornings further back. They come out right in the trails where you expect them in the evening. But in the morning, they seem to want to smell that bedding area before they go into it. And they go in a little different every day. But they still come from that same direction. So being a little further back before they start doing their circle or their J-hook is a better option. Again, it was a rut hunt, November 4th. It was the second time of the year that I hunted that, that tree. So it wasn't a first sit, it was a second sit. But it was quite a difference in time. The first sit was in early September. The, the kill sit was November 4th. I was hunting the buck that I shot. I shot him on the same trail I was glassing him on during the summer. The next biggest buck is a 10-pointer I took off of uh, a conservancy. A conservancy is kind of like uh, half public, half private. It's actually private, but you apply to hunt there and you know other people apply to hunt there and you, you hunt in there with other people and it's not like you have any kind of control um, but there is controlled numbers of people hunting so it is private uh, land that you have access to now this particular conservancy was a very large conservancy and I could get back as far as two miles from the truck and where I was hunting was I was planning on going all the way to the back and looping around into a point. And on my way back, I ran into some deer chasing, some bucks chasing does and stuff. Came back here to hunt, and there's a lot of sign. I didn't get where I wanted to go. 
And there's a lot of grunting and chasing going on over there. I just want to see what's going on. And I tried to move a little closer and a little closer, and then I noticed amongst where they kept running through, there was a fairly large buck bedded watching them. So I slipped off my shoes and socks and tried to ease over without making any noise. And I got to about 25 yards and the deer started getting a little buggy, so I shot. It looks like I got me another one. I was coming back here to go hunting and uh, I saw some deer running around so I started sneaking over there and uh, amongst the deer there was one pretty good sized buck bedded. So uh, it's pretty noisy back here with the leaves and crap. Uh, I'm in swamps to get that suction noise too so I took off my boots and socks and one step at a time I went into the wind until I got within range and I had to just get over a little bit to get a shot and I shot him right in his bed. It was a good poke but uh, I got him, I saw him run and he went back down and he's laying right up here so he ain't moving, I'm pretty sure he's down. Yeah, he's down. I was uh, heading back to my stand and uh, where I was going to sit and I saw a bunch of deer running in front of me so I started going real slow and there was a lot of does going back. I didn't see any antlers or anything but then watching the does I saw this rack and some grass in the swamp turning and watching them and he was only about uh, oh, 50, 60 yards away so I contemplated what to do and uh, I didn't feel he was going to go in my direction and it was real noisy walking and swamp muck and uh, grass and stuff so I slipped my, uh, my boots off and my socks off and I snuck real slow a step at a time and I got to about 25 yards from him and uh, shot him in the bread box and uh, it was kind of funny because he got up and he only ran about 10-15 yards and just flopped over and uh, I got over, I tagged him, and uh, started field dressing him. I found another arrow hole way back in the hams and in the intestines, and uh, it was pretty fresh. I looked around, there was no blood trail or anything, so I field dressed him, and I uh, called Mario and uh, told him to get out here, and that was probably about, what, uh, 240? 245, yeah. Yeah. So then, uh, then the hunter came along on the trail and uh, said that uh, he was the one who hit it. Uh, he said he hit a branch and deflected into the intestines. Uh, he only waited two hours to track it, so if he would have jumped it, it would have been probably gone. Yeah. So I don't know if he'd have got it or not, but I was able to sneak up and get an arrow in it, so maybe. But I was pretty stealthy, too. I was, I was really going slow. Um, I contemplated whether or not to give it to him or not, and uh, decided since I already had my tag on it and it was field dressed, I, I kept it. Yeah. The guy was real gracious about it. I think if he didn't insist it, I'd have just gave it to him. But uh, but it's a nice buck, and it's a crazy yeah, it hunt is. like usual. Yeah, nothing boring. Yeah, never with me. <laughs> there was a really big one around, but what are we down to? Uh, I think we got uh, four or five days left. Yeah, 12th of November. And I got to work next week, so I really got tomorrow. You know, I could have probably took one or two days off during the week, but... Right. I mean, this is uh, about one and three-quarter miles from the truck. Yep. And uh, Mario knew this was a heavy deer, so he took his his real time about getting here. <laughs> so I've already dragged this three-quarters of a mile. <laughs> I knew he'd, he'd make his way to the river. <laughs> yeah, he was hoping I'd get across the river, but I waited at the river for him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's load it up and get it back. It's going to be a long night. All right. That spot looked a little deeper. Yeah. I'm trying to step on the cattail roots. You punch through, it's literally up to here. That was 
better than I thought it would be. Look at that there, Dan. Nice work. That sled comes in handy, that's for sure. I already had my socks off from stalking. Some of the key takeaways with this buck are that I was not hunting this buck. It was a very remote area of the conservancy that not very many people got to. I shot this buck right in its bed. I had never hunted that spot before. This was an afternoon hunt. The next buck came off of Dave's farm. Dave's farm is 70 acres. It's got a lot of pressure around the outside. Uh, this buck um, we knew about. We found a shed from it the year before, but had never really seen much of it on the farm. Dave did a hunt opening weekend, kind of an observation slash hunt. And from his observation stand, he spied this buck across the field and saw it uh, come out right at the edge of darkness, right at the edge of shooting light. So the next day, we kind of tried to figure out where it came from. And there's this bedding area down this hill and down into the swamp on the edge of the property that I thought they might be coming out of there through this little funnel, this spot that we hunt only every now and then. It's a really great spot. All the bedding comes together. But it might be coming from someplace else. So Dave hunted where he saw the buck. And if it came out at the same time frame, he'd be able to shoot it within the last five minutes of shooting. And I'd circle around and go down in where I thought this buck was coming from. And we both went in as we do often, or did often back in those days, go in as a team and go after these bucks. And the buck came out by me. He came out of his bedding right where I thought he'd be. I was 75 yards from his bed. He came out. Um, I shot him, he turned around and he ran right back to his bed, turned around in his bed and was facing, looking to see if uh, we we're coming in to track him. Look in our direction, shot through the heart. So shot through the heart, he made it to that bed, turned around and watched back. But the bed was only 75 yards from where he was shot. So that was... Uh, it was either the second day of the season or the third day. I think it was the third day. I think it was uh, Monday when we shot it. I think he saw it on Sunday. So I think it was the third day of the season. What happened? Oh, that's velvet on there. Nice shot, Dan. <laughs> that's a big deer. Yeah, 150. Yeah. Okay. Some of the takeaways from that hunt, it was early season. It was private land. 75 yards from the bed, first sit of the year. The spot had been sat before, but it was the first sit of the year. We observed the buck, then moved in for the kill. It was an afternoon hunt. I was hunting specifically for this buck. The next buck was shot in the conservancy again. This buck was shot late season. I was trying to find a big buck to hunt, and I went looking for tracks and sign in fresh snow trying to find a target. And me and Mario went to the conservancy and walked a human trail, a human access trail that people walk a lot. And we didn't leave that trail because we didn't want the bucks to figure out they were being hunted. They were used to people on that trail, but we could walk that trail and see if there were any tracks coming in and out. And we cut some really big buck tracks. So we got a big buck track coming through here. And he's come through twice. And snow's three days old. So I'm thinking it's evening because he hasn't come through yet. You know, because this is day three. Right. He's came through two days in a row on this trail. So if you look at this track here, I mean, it's not splayed and I can get all four fingers in it. I know they always look smaller on video, but that's it. Four fingers are fitting in there and it's not splayed. And here he is again here. You can see a little bit of a wedge in there. Four fingers. That's how far between the tracks. I can't even step that far. That's a big buck. The other one goes off. Right to the corner, dude. Yep. They're all coming off that transition. I know where I'd be if I were you. Hey, you don't even need your hand. I That's know. my size 13 boot right there. <laughs> Look at the size of that track. That's the one we're after. And there's one of his tracks up there, too, next to this boot front. Yep. Going in the other direction. 
Both directions, right here. Right here. We got another one too. Splayed out. Oh yeah. Look at, Look at the size of that. And we figured out that those buck tracks were coming from a certain area where we knew the bedding. They're coming from and going to. And we were pretty sure of where that buck was probably bedding. We went after this buck by setting up in a couple spots where he would come out a certain way based on the tracks. And we didn't get a crack at him right away. Then we gave it a second chance. And Mario went in and got real close to the bedding and a tree where the tracks were coming out. And I circled around and got on the trail where it went a little different out. And the buck came by me. Got me another one. <laughs> Holy crap. January 13th, end of the season. Two old warriors met in the swamp today. Only one's coming out alive. Time to call the pallbearers. Oh, he's got a lot of mass. Oh, look at those giant feet. This is the buck. This is the buck that was leaving the tracks. I got him. Oh, that's a massive buck. Look at that. Nice. Obviously mature. Look how big he is. That's the buck we were seeing the tracks from. Some takeaways from this hunt. It was late season. We found this buck by cutting a track. I didn't know the buck, but I was hunting the buck. I had not seen him. I just knew by that track it was a big buck. We used a hiking trail to keep the buck from figuring us out. We worked as a team and covered both exits where this deer was coming out of his bedding. It was an evening hunt. I was 100 yards from the bedding. It was private property, conservancy property. The next buck was a public land buck that was in an area I hunted quite a bit. and. There was a bed scrape that was used several years in a row where there's a couple bedding areas right next to each other. And the bucks coming in and out of that bedding area would use that, that scrape and communicate to each other. And it got even a little more used, you know, towards, you know, mid-October. And I went in for the first sit of the year, found the scrape was really used well got in there in the morning, set up right over the top of it, and at gray light, that buck came in, worked that scrape, was gonna head into his bedding, and I shot him. He ran into his bedding, and I was having a real hard time finding blood. I searched and searched, I found a speck here, a speck there, 
And I thought the shot was pretty good, but I could not find good blood. And uh, he was running up the side of a river, and uh, the trail kind of went straight, but I just lost all blood going up that trail. And it really wasn't too much of anywhere else he could go. So I thought, well, maybe he crossed the river. If he went the other way, I would have probably seen him run through open terrain. So I went back and I scanned the edge of the river and I found one big fresh track running down where I had lost blood. And then I saw a speck of blood on the mud and I knew he went into the river there to cross. So then I went and uh, I had to walk all the way out, drive all the way around, go to the spot on the other side of that river and go up and down that river and I couldn't find the track coming back out of the river. I tried to find blood over there, I tried to find, I couldn't find no sign. And I kept going up and down the river looking and then I saw something sticking out of the water where there was just like a little V in the water where the, the uh, current's going around something. And I looked close and it looked like a tine. And I went over and I stared at it as much as I could and sure enough it was a tine. And I had to jump in the river in real deep water and get this buck. He had died crossing the river and washed down and got caught up in some underwater degree, debris, debris. And the only thing that gave him away was that one tine sticking out of the water. But we got him. Some of the takeaways, it was public land, 100 yards from bedding. It was a morning hunt, and I never saw that buck before. It was mid-October, I was hunting a bed scrape, and it was the first sit of the year, but not the first sit ever. The next buck was a big, mature buck that I had seen glassing in the summer and was keeping track of, and I knew where he was bedding, I knew how he was traveling out of the bedding, and I went in there opening day, and set up right where he's coming out of bedding and ended up shooting him. And he went about 100 yards, crashed and died. Um, what was interesting about him is he had a huge rack, but he had four up on this side, no brow tine. And he had a brow tine on this side and only two up. So he was an eight pointer, but he scored as a six. And I actually had that one scored and it's, it made Pope and Young as a six pointer. Some of the takeaways, Again, it was a public land buck. It was a first time sit. It was a buck killed by observations. It was opening day. I was 75 yards from the bedding area. It was an evening hunt. I was hunting this particular buck when I shot him. The next buck was a nine pointer that I shot again on opening day after observing him during the summer. Caught this one glassing from the road during the summer. Started keeping an eye on him. And right up to season, I was seeing him on a regular basis coming out of bedding, going into a field right at the edge of darkness. I went and sat up right where he was coming out and shot him opening day. Again, this buck, I was 100 yards from his bedding. It was the first sit ever in that spot. It was public land. It was a buck I observed. I was hunting the buck I shot. It was an evening hunt and it was opening day. So stories are great. But how do we use this data to help us become better hunters? So before I even get into the data, I just want to say that when I look at my average bucks, the, you know, the three-year-olds, um, the ones in that range, those bucks don't match the data of the older mature bucks. Just keep that in mind. I think you have to hunt mature bucks to kill big bucks. So. Let's take a look at the data and see if there's any trends. Hunting within 100 yards of the buck bed, 11 out of 12 of these bucks were shot within 100 yards of the buck bed. That's almost all of them. 8 out of 12 of them were shot on public land. Even though I have access to private and I've hunted some pretty good private, 8 of the top 12 bucks that I've shot have come from public land. First sit ever almost half of the bucks were from the very first time I ever sat that spot. It goes to show you how those deer figure you out and how they get mature they really figure out where you're hunting. And to even lock that down even a little better, first sit of the season it's 11 out of 12, almost all of them. 5 out of 12 of them were shot opening week of bow season. Many of those were opening day that's almost half telling you that the rut is a little overrated and that you know when you look at the stats the majority of bucks I've put on my wall 
or during the rut. But look at this, almost half of the biggest bucks were shot early season. Telling me that those bigger bucks, the mature ones, are more vulnerable opening week than they are during the rut. Of course, those five bucks that I shot opening week out of my top 12 were also, you know, well scouted, well patterned and such. So there's a give and take to it. But if, if you know what you're doing, opening week can be better than rut for mature bucks. So seven out of 12, a little more than half, were shot in early season. Four out of 12 were shot in rut, one third, which I think a lot of people would have thought that number would have been a lot higher. But really, I find hunting the mature bucks during the rut harder. And, you know, even the ones that were shot in rut were a little earlier in rut than most people hunt. When they just start, you know, laying down all that sign, but they're still on patterns. Once they're starting to run around crazy, it gets pretty hard to predict them. And I only shot one out of 12 of my big bucks in late season. However, I'm almost always tagged out by late season. I do think late season is a great time to hunt. I can get on bucks real easy, but it is kind of hard to shoot them. They bust you a lot in the trees with no cover. Nine out of the top 12 bucks I've shot were shot in the evening. That's the majority. And what that tells us is that in the evenings, they're more patternable, they come out more uh, consistent, they're easier to figure out. So for a guy who's planning his hunts, the evenings seem to work a little better. Two out of my top 12 bucks were shot in the morning. And what's key about those two is they're both during rut. One of my bucks, arguably the biggest one, was shot midday over a buck bed scrape. Now. The thing with that buck is, is he was religiously coming in from observations in the evening. And I got out there earlier that day because it was raining. And the rain was intermittent. And I just felt like when it stopped, that buck would come out and work that scrape. Because he seemed to really be competing with the smaller nine-pointer that was in the same adjacent bedding area. That happened just like I thought when it stopped raining, he came out to that scrape. But I think the rain had a part to do with that midday hunt working out. And I think if he wouldn't have came out midday, I would have shot him in the afternoon that same day. Three out of 12, one quarter of the bucks shot in my top 12 were more than a mile from the access, very remote. So one fourth, but bucks betting within 200 yards of the road or the access, five out of 12, almost half. But if you notice, there isn't a lot of in between. There's not a lot of room for the, you know, the ones that are not a mile and not right next to the road. So it's, it's pretty likely that if I shoot a, a monster buck, it's in some little hidden spot near the road or something so remote people aren't getting to it. Six out of 12 of these bucks, exactly half, were bedding in spots isolated by water. And what I mean by that is the bed was in thick cover surrounded by water. They had thick escape, they had good escape and stuff, but they had water isolation to the beds. I'm finding that a lot with mature bucks. And six out of 12, that's a lot. Three out of the 12, so one quarter of the biggest bucks I've shot were killed at buck bedding scrapes. And what a buck bedding scrape is, is a scrape that is within 100 yards of a bed where there's multiple bucks bedding in an area, not in the same spot, but in an area, and they come out and they stage at one spot, and that's where the scrape is. And it's a competing scrape between bucks. One quarter of my top 12 bucks were shot on those types of scrapes, where normally I don't have very much luck on just regular scrapes. Now here's an interesting stat. Six out of my top 12 bucks were observed in the spot that I killed them prior to the kill. That means killing really big bucks, observing them is key. Now you get into the majority of my bucks again. The majority of the bucks hanging on my wall, a lot of them are younger, three-year-olds and such, were not observed. They were, they were not killed that way. 
we're talking about the biggest ones. Nine out of the top 12 bucks that I shot, the majority, I was hunting the buck that I shot. Again, that's not the case with the three-year-olds and such. Those are killed more in the funnels, more in the food plots, more in the good spots that you kill one in year after year. I hope these stats helped you, and I hope you had fun reliving these hunts with me. Thanks for watching.